Stephen Paddock's killing spree on October 1st was the deadliest one-man shooting in the history of this country. 58 people were killed. He died as well. It's a tragedy that demands answers, but instead questions have only piled up. Why have we heard nothing more about Mary Lou Danley, for example, his girlfriend, Paddock's girlfriend, even though police say she may be hiding something? Where was Vegas's 40-member SWAT team as Paddock went on his rampage? For ourselves, we have asked why Las Vegas police have repeatedly obstructed our questions or been outright hostile to us. Weeks ago, they refused to provide answers to basic questions about security guard Jesus Campos, the one who took off from Mexico right after the shooting. Today, they made it impossible for us to get a filming permit on public land. Why is that? We have no idea. But it tells you something interesting. Catherine Lombardo is an attorney representing many of the shooting victims here in Las Vegas. Doug Papa is a former police officer and casino security expert, and they join us both tonight. Thank you both for coming on. Thanks, um, Parker. So, Doug, give me the overview here. We we were talking in the break. We have compiled a list, my producers uh, and I, of questions to which we have no answers. Very basic questions. I won't um, repeat them on the air. But basically, we know basically nothing. That's true. Why? I don't have any idea. Um, it was one of the reasons why I started writing the stories right after the incident for the Baltimore Post Examiner. I wrote 35 stories to date and try to get some answers from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And every time you called up the PIO, it, initially they're either very rude or they just say they comment that it's an ongoing investigation and they can't talk. I had some specific uh, things that really bothered me from the start. Is, is One is where was the 40-member SWAT team the night of the worst mass shooting in American history? And as Let, I, let's stop right there. What's the answer to that? Um, nobody knows, and actually nobody actually asked the question to Sheriff Lombardo to this day. I was the only one that wrote these in the stories. Um, I do not know where they were. I do know from doing my investigation and talking to sources um, within and outside the Metropolitan Police Department that Levi Hancock, who was the officer that breached the door with explosives, went in with an ad hoc team of two canine officers and a, uh, I believe Donaldson was the gang unit detective. And he was a little concerned about his safety from what I was told because he was going in with people he never worked with before. Uh, his SWAT team members were anywhere in sight. Um, that's one of the things I raised, one of the issues I raised yeah. in the story. I do not know. Um, and, and that's, you can add that to a long list of things we don't know. So I, I think a basic question I've had from the beginning, and I haven't heard it addressed, is did Stephen Paddock come to the attention of authorities, federal, state, or local, before this shooting? And I'm not alleging a conspiracy, but it's a basic question. Did they know who this guy was? Do you know the answer to that? I don't know the answer, but I suspect the answer is yes, based on what I've heard. Listen, I can't remember what's rumor, what's conspiracy theory, and what's facts on some days, but I've heard a lot of things. I've actually received a lot of information on paper. Yeah, I think they knew who he was. Of course they knew who he so, was. So uh, answer that even more basic question. You're handling the legal end of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Where's the information coming from? The FBI have apparently taken over the bulk mm -hmm. of the investigation. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. there a central source for known facts about what happened, or is it just ad hoc? There is no source right now at all for any information as to what happened. Like I've said from the beginning, we expect it to take four to six months for the investigation. Look, I've said from the beginning that the lawyers for MGM and the corporate executives have been hunkered down in a room from day one, moment one, and they are putting all of their resources to protection of themselves, defending well, that's, themselves. Well, that's it right there. Look, I don't know the answer to any of these questions, but mm -hmm. I know lying when I see it. Mm -hmm. I can smell it, and there's a lot of it around this story. I suspect that, I'm not alleging a cover-up, I don't think it's as simple as that, but that the authorities are trying to cloak their incompetence from the public. Do you have evidence that that's true? Well, one of the, one of the things I, I picked up on the stories I did a story on was that um, I was told through sources inside and outside the police department, and I verified it, um, was that the homicide division early on was pulled off this case. Now, homicide detectives normally investigate homicides and suicides because you don't know if a suicide is actually a homicide until it's investigated. Right. They were pulled off the case, and the case was given to an entirely different um, bureau commander. It answers to something to the public accountability section. Now, the captain of the of that um, force investigation team that's investigating the paddock shooting, and I was told this by the homicide unit of the LVMPD. The captain who oversees that bureau is Captain Kelly McMahill, who's the wife of the number two guy running the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, uh, under Sheriff Kevin McMahill. Um, seems a little bit bizarre to me. When I try to get some answers from Metro Police to find out why the homicide division was pulled off and it was given to the force investigating team, and you got to understand something. The 
force investigation team for Metro investigates officer-involved shootings and police officer use of force. Um, I could not get any answer. Right. Well, um, that's, I mean, that's the story of this whole thing. So let me, Kathleen, let yeah. me ask you just a couple of really simple mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. that I've been wondering about. From the very beginning, we heard about bump stocks. Mm -hmm. that, that was kind of the, the signature piece of hardware from this atrocity, mm -hmm. the bump stock. Mm -hmm. And yet the photographs of the rifles in the room that mm -hmm. were publicly disseminated mm -hmm. had bipods on them. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's ever operated a bump stock or understands how it works can tell you you can't operate a rifle with a bump stock if it's got a bipod because it doesn't move back and forth mm -hmm. in the way that it needs to. Mm -hmm. Are they still saying that bump stocks were used in this? Is that still a claim? They haven't told us, but what we suspect is that he had a complete and total arsenal upstairs in his room. But for what purposes? And, and why would he have two shooting mm. positions when mm. only one, just looking at it, it, it mm -hmm. seems like the angles were not, was not necessary to have two. Do you, any insight on that? Based on what we've heard, it was fully planned out by him. He was up there for, we think, six days. Now, you know that the first few days he was there, he was, uh, I think, registered under his girlfriend's name. So he was actually there for five or six days planning this. We don't think he left the room once. Were housekeepers ever in the room? We don't think housekeepers were allowed in the room uh, either. He had the do not disturb sign. So once MGM, Mandalay Bay, gives us the answers that I've requested, uh, that we've requested through our subpoena right. process, you know, through the civil investigation, right. pursuant to the lawsuit, listen, I just received a piece of information last week. I received the special event permit from the city. And there it is in black and white, handwritten, filled out by an MGM executive for this event that happened right behind us. It wasn't Live Nation Entertainment. It was MGM, a corporate executive, who filled out the special event permit for this particular concert. Huh. So their fingerprints are all over it. So why would, finally, Doug, why would the interior door be locked? Police said they broke through, A, and B, how in the world could an officer have fired a f weapon accidentally in the room after the shooting? Is there any explanation for how that might have happened? No. Again, I raised both those issues in, in my story. As far as for the door being locked, because they did breach the outer door when they went in. Yes. You heard that on the radio. And then when he went in after they cleared the first room, you hear him on the radio saying, we have to breach the second door in five seconds. Now, if you're breaching the door, obviously they couldn't get in, so it was locked. And my question has always been, well, who locked that door? According to Sheriff Lombardo, Paddock committed suicide right after he fired his last round, somewhere in that time period. So who locked that door from the inside? Because it had to be locked from the it's inside. A, it's, a, it's, a great, it's, it's one of many questions, no and I, I suspect we should be here all week into next month to get great. answers. Great. Um, but we're going to continue following the story. Thank you both very Thank much. Thank you for no covering this. I appreciate, appreciate it. it we too. mean it. Thank you.